I greet you in the spirit of Moses and Harriet and Sojourner. I greet you in the spirit of Medgar and Malcolm and Martin, in the spirit of those who own slave ships were stacked like sardines in a can. No food to eat, clean water to drink or bathrooms to use, who were beaten and battered, who were diseased and disheartened, but who were not forsaken. For in them, although unborn and not in the construction, the original construction of this country, was the hope of freedom, freedom for themselves and for their legacy. I greet you in the spirit of those who worked in cotton fields around Athens and the University of Georgia from sun up to sundown, who heard the tolling of the bells at the end of the Civil War and heard freedom in its midst the 13th Amendment to the Constitution, outlawing involuntary servitude, African chattel slavery, the 14th Amendment, finally guaranteeing for them full rights and privileges of citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, guaranteeing the right to participate in the search for the common good. And yet despite those American promises, They endured the hoses and the dogs and the separate but unequal and the poll taxes and the literacy tests and the strange fruit hanging on their trees and bodies floating down their rivers. Those promises yet unfulfilled and unrealized. But they heard a preacher from Georgia Stand on the Lincoln Memorial and speak to a nation and speak to a world that freedom would ring from every hill and every mountainside. And so promises were made in the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act. Promises made. But if we were honest with ourselves today, as we must, if we're ever to deal finally with race, we would agree that race plays an exaggerated role in too many of our lives. It prevents the full measure of what it means to be a participant in America's democracy. Those great promises given by Thomas Jefferson in the Declaration of Independence, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men, and dare I say women, are created equal and are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, those rights which cannot be bought or bartered or compromised, those rights that do not need bipartisan support of a Congress, or the signature of a president, and they don't even need the popular approval of the majority. Chief of these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And from the very construction of this country, race mattered. It mattered in the construction, Article 1, Section 2, life discounted the lives of those Africans held in involuntary servitude, slavery, counting them three-fifths of persons. It totally denied humanness to certain indigenous people, calling them savages. And where humanness was recognized, it foreclosed the ability to search for the common good for women altogether. Article 1, Section 9, Liberty foreclosed the right of Congress from being able to do anything to stop the slave trade prior prior to 1808. And so from 1787 to 1808, the constitutional government of this country tied its own hands to prevent that chattel slavery, foreclosed liberty from all of those 
within its borders and the pursuit of happiness. The Constitution mandated that, that those persons who were held in slavery, if they wanted to pursue happiness and escaped from their involuntary servitude, would be captured and returned upon payment of the government. I am here to argue that we harvest the spirit of Ted and be honest about race. That we not ignore it and act as if it doesn't exist because it does. Here are three things that I know about American racism. First, that race itself is a fiction. Secondly, racism as a theory, practice, and discrimination matters. Racism matters. And third, people matter more. Race is a fiction. Scientists in this room will tell us that race has no biological meaning at all. That there are more differences between the color of a cat's eyes than there are between people. That we all belong to the same species and share and have a common origin. And if that is true, and that is is an earth-shattering idea in and of itself, that race, which is so closely tied to identity in this country, is a complete social construct, that it does not exist. If that is true, then all persons possess the same faculties for attaining the highest levels of intellectual and economic and political and social and educational achievements. And where there are gaps in achievements between groups of people, and there certainly are major gaps, that they are not on the account of the color of a person's skin. They are not attributable to race, but they are attributable to racism as practice in discrimination. Race is a fiction, but racism matters. My wife, Dr. Mika Renee Williams Johnson, who is an alumni of this institution as well, we have three children. We have a 17-week-old Langston Hughes Elijah Johnson. He joins his brother Thurgood Marshall Joshua and Frederick Douglass Caleb. But race still matters in his life. Although both his parents have received a partial fulfillment of the, of the democracy for which we belong. We both have doctorate degrees from this institution. But race still plays an exaggerated role in his life. As a matter of fact, Langston has twice the chance of a white child and three times the chance of an Asian child, according to the National Center for Health Statistics, of dying during infancy. His mother is twice as likely to never have received prenatal care. His father is twice as likely to be unemployed. And for those who are employed, even with similar degrees as their white counterparts, we can only expect to earn 72% in income. Indeed, the median income for families that look like me in this state, $31,500. The median income for a similarly situated white family in this state, $51,000. That's not attributable to the color of a person's skin. That's attributable to racism as a theory in practice in discrimination. If Langston survives childhood at all, he would more likely have attended a crumbling and underperforming school that does not give him a world-class education preparing him for global opportunities. That if he's ever accused of crime, it will be chiefly determined and race is still, the color of his skin is still the best indicator of whether he'll be pulled over by the police or not in the first place. If he is accused of crime, whether he will be tried as a juvenile or as an adult, what kind of plea bargain he will be offered. If he will be tried under the death penalty. From the cradle to the grave. Racism, a theory, practice, and discrimination matters. And it matters for this reason. 
Race, and like all of the other isms, is legally constructed, socially maintained, politically expedient, and still confers too many economic benefits. Here's what I know. People matter more. The values that we share in this representative democracy, I believe, are shared by all people. The fact that we all should have a right, and as Barbara Jordan was fond of saying, we have continued to expand the we in the we the people. We all have a right to participate in the search for that which is the common good for our community. The right to political participation. And over the last 105 years, the NAACP has grew on the collective courage of millions of people of all different kinds of walks of life who've come together around that shared idea. We all believe that our children deserve the very best education that will prepare them for those global opportunities that we discussed earlier. We believe that our communities should be built and if they are not, they should be rebuilt in such a way that it promotes healthiness and wholeness, good places to live, work and play. That if we have to stand before bars of justice, that we should stand regardless of our walk of life on equal footing. These are shared values that we can all rally around. These shared values, if we put people over politics, politics is who gets what, when, where, and how. We will find the solution to overcoming race. And people are already doing this. In Gwinnett County, there's a budding group of students, students who are at risk African-Americans, who are studying and being tutored together with undocumented Americans. Those undocumented Americans are learning English as a second language. And proficiency tests are demonstrating that not only are the African-American students doing, doing better than their white counterparts on Spanish as a second language, but undocumented Americans are doing better with English as a second language on those same proficiency exams. Communities who normally would have been separated by language and culture and all other kinds of things that continue to demand that they are separated are coming together and a strange type of fusion is taking place that the whole is greater than the, the sum of its parts not just in individual pockets like up in Gwinnett but across the south a new southern strategy is emerging if America is the most diverse place on the face of the earth the south is quickly becoming the most diverse region in the most diverse nation on the face of the earth and so in that lies a great power if we harness it, if we are willing to struggle with and finally confront race, to deconstruct it where it legally exists and is practiced through institutions, where it is socially maintained across society, where it is still politically expedient for politicians to urge an old Southern strategy to divide and conquer people separate them and tell them how different they are from one another. And if we root up and destroy any economic benefit conferred by race classification, it is only then that we will overcome it. There's an exciting group that's taking shape in North Carolina. They call themselves Moral Monday in Georgia. We call ourselves Moral Monday in South Carolina. It's too, Truthful Tuesday, but in a real sense, I don't care if it's uh, Witness Wednesday or Tell It Like It Is Thursday or Freedom Friday or Salvation Saturday. <laughs> it's fascinating because people who would have normally been working in their silos on their individual isms, sexism and homophobism and classism and racism are, dis are coming together and realizing that at the root of all of the isms are conferred economic benefits, politically, political expediency, a social maintenance that we, that we all have unconsciously and sometimes consciously participated in, and a legal construct that says if it is not a part of the dominant group, then it is other. 
that the dominant group is supreme, whether it's with race and white supremacy, and as such, it should be privileged, as in race in terms of white privilege. And so Mar Monday is sweeping across the South, and it has a potential if we are willing to struggle. Ted knows something about struggle, struggling with these ideas, and not giving up on them until we have worked them out. Men and women who want progress but don't want struggle or like Frederick Douglass tells us, are like men and women who want crops but they don't want to plow up the ground. They want rain but they don't want thunder and lightning. They want to walk on warm beaches, have their toes in its sand, but they don't want the roar of its awful waters. There can be no progress without struggle. This past Tuesday, the TED event organizers were a little bit shaken up. They discovered that I had been arrested as a part of a group of 72 others who were demanding at our governor's office that he not stand like former governors had stood in the doorway of progress, in the doorway of schoolhouses, and in the doorways of hospitals. And it wasn't because I had some self-interest in insurance. I'm insured. And those who were arrested were insured. But we fundamentally understand that a part of that struggle is an American struggle, all of our struggles. And so there is a new Southern strategy emerging that will engage in a third reconstruction because we fundamentally understand about race that it is a fiction, that that racism does matter, and that is what we must place our efforts towards eradicating. And thirdly, that people matter more. And across all these isms, we will work to dig up and deconstruct its legal construction, its political expediency, its social maintenance, and its economic benefits. Because we've got promises to keep. And the woods, I know, are lonely, dark, and deep. But as an association, as individuals, as those whose birthright is to take America as we find it and to make it a more perfect union, we've got miles and miles to go before we sleep. May we participate in this struggle, peace and power.